Welcome. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Jim Persley, president here at Hinge Health. And we're here today with our second episode of Pain Points, uh, an ongoing series where I'm joined by leaders, experts, and practitioners from industry and academia to explore topics at the intersection of healthcare, technology, and innovation. Today, it is my great pleasure to be joined by Dr. DJ Kennedy, professor and chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Kenny also serves on the Hinge Health Clinical Advisory Board and is here today to discuss digital and clinical innovations transforming how we think about and treat pain. Dr. Kenny, uh, my team tells me that you prefer to be called DJ. Can I call you DJ? Absolutely. It's a great marker for uh, who knows me best. So I, I look forward to it. All right. All right. Well, DJ, thank you uh, again for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start by just letting the audience get to know you a little better. Um, can you share just a little bit about your background and what led you uh, to PMM, PMNR, which is, again, physical medicine and rehabilitation, and, uh, and what ultimately brought you to Vanderbilt? Sure. It's a specialty not many people know about, or at least depending on the part of the country. Uh, my background, I, uh, I went to college to be a strength conditioning coach and uh, did that at Florida State University under Coach Bowden and uh, Dave Van Hallinger in the 90s. Um, and Really loved it. Loved you it. know, undefeated Seminoles right now. I was part of the undefeated Seminoles. Uh, I, I bleed garnet. I do have to admit that. Um, but we, you know, in that role, I mean, it was about injury prevention. It was about injury treatment. Um, and I combined that with a real love of science and uh, went into medicine and had no idea what physical medicine rehabilitation was. But once I found it, I uh, was, was lucky. I feel very lucky to have found it, sought out the best training around. I was able to go to Tulane, University of Washington, Northwestern, uh, before becoming faculty at Stanford. And uh, Stanford was a great place, especially with the digital uh, input and uh, honing my craft. And then Vanderbilt uh, started a new program. So I'm the second chair at Vanderbilt. And uh, when I looked at the opportunities here um, to grow something at a preeminent institution to be the, the build the best program in the nation, it was just too much to pass up. And it's a uh, it's great. It's fertile ground with spectacular colleagues, great research, uh, things like our OSHA Integrative Medicine Center, uh, strong colleagues, everything that allows us to grow that. And I'm I'm thrilled to be here. I've been here about four and a half years now. Oh, well, fantastic. Well. Vanderbilt is a is a fantastic university and a medical center, and Nashville seems to be gathering people from all over the country over the last uh, handful of years. So uh, it's definitely are, the it uh, city right now. So we, I, I really, I've 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 liked it. I love the city as well as the institution, and couldn't be happier. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. And uh, as you said, you lead the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab uh, at Vandy, and you know a lot of your work is really at the intersection of research and innovation. So you are both looking at the present, uh, but you're also tasked with looking in the future. So, you know, kind of starting with the present, I guess, um, love to just get your thoughts, uh, DJ, on, you know, what impact uh, do you see musculoskeletal conditions having on uh, society at large, the communities that you treat and care for, uh, and on employers and, and, and on providers, like your employer, uh, Vanderbilt Medical Center? That's a, a great question. It's a huge impact. Um, when I think of musculoskeletal concerns, I really think of the, the skeletal system in general and, and, and both the spine, so neck, back pain, low back pain. And then I think of hips, knees, shoulders. I mean, this is all musculoskeletal. And if you find a person out there that is aware of, ha has never had neck pain or back pain or shoulder pain or something like that, that's, that's a real anomaly. We actually know back pain alone is you know, the number two cause of disability in the working group. So not only are we talking about permanent disability, but we are talking days work miss. We're talking all kinds of things that way. And if you add in all of these other musculoskeletal complaints, it is clearly the driver of disability. Um, by the way, the other leading cause of disability is uh, anxiety, depression, um, which mm. by the way, exercise, I think is a pretty good treatment for as well. Um, just as, as a side note, um, but it's huge. In my practice, my clinical practice focuses mostly on spine. And our data shows us that somewhere around 80 to 90% of people have back pain at some point in their life. Um, I personally think that stat tells us that 10 to 20% of people have a bad memory or, or young enough <laughs> not to have had it at this point. But yeah. it, uh, that may be my bias as a spine specialist. So it's, it's huge. I mean, it's a, it's a major thing we're dealing with that affects wide uh, 
uh, bandwidth and wide groups of our population. Yeah. Yeah, you think about uh, one of the things that drew me to Hinge and this uh, tackling pain in musculoskeletal is you think about it, you know, it's it's both literally and figuratively the foundation of health. You know, that, yes. that idea of movement is medicine, that idea that the skeleton is the is the framework, the foundation with which everything else is built around. It's both that literal and figurative foundation for a health. You talked about, you know, depression, anxiety. Uh, you know, you talked about pain. You know, when we when we are, you know, all related to our ability to to move and to engage with the things that we love, and and, and so it um, it doesn't surprise me that you know eighty percent of us have experienced you know some type of uh, you know MSK pain, including back pain, and and um, uh, either that or like you said, you're just too young or you have a bad memory. But uh, <laughs> exercise is really medicine, right? I mean, we know that, right? And if you if you really think of all the things that it impacts, right? Um, we know it has a huge impact on the ability to treat and prevent musculoskeletal complaints uh, from a variety of reasons. We know it has effects on cardiovascular and lung disease. We know it has effects on depression, anxiety. I mean, we're talking massive, massive movers in healthcare systems today and, and things that are affecting employers, our loved ones, our friends, our family, um, and our workforce. Um, you know, and, and so it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. You know, thinking about, um, really, whether it's uh, you know, chronic pain or any other chronic condition, uh, ideally, the goal is, is preventative care, if, if we can, it's, it's better than treatment. Uh, if we can prevent something, uh, it's even better to get upstream. How do you think about uh, in your work, whether it was as a strength coach, or now, uh, as the as the chair of the department at Vandy, you know, how do you think about prevention in, in the context of that overall continuum of muscular skeletal health? Well, you nailed it. An ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. Um, you know, I actually apply my uh, strength training principles to guide my general care and, and thinking through this. So let me give a very tangible example. I, within the last two weeks, I had a patient ask me, you know, she was traveling and saying, what, what can I do? And, you know, one of the tangible aspects is you have a 50 pound back uh, suitcase that you're, you're lifting. So what you don't want is for that to be your one rep maximum. You haven't lifted, you haven't done anything. So now all of a sudden life becomes this one rep maximum that is just more likely to injure yourself. So, you know, for general patients, I try to get them if they can do something with strength training where it is, and I'm a huge fan of strength training, that we can do graded controlled exercises and you know, you can control it and you know, you can do it. So if you're taking and lifting 10 pounds in each arm on curls, you know, you can lift 20 pounds, you know, you can do it without an injury. And that's a good way of thinking, you know, I can do this in a controlled environment. Maybe now I can do this in life. Um, and I think if we think through those principles of how do we set ourselves up for injury prevention, I mean, that's a big task of a strength coach is to, to actually make people bigger, faster, stronger, make them better able to withstand these injuries. And then also, if they do get them, they have more muscle, more ability to recover from them in a quicker fashion. So um, I, I do think, you know, a sedentary lifestyle is not a good thing. And that's part of the reason we probably have so many musculoskeletal injuries. Um, there's whole websites on sitting as the new smoking, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and I think getting people moving in any number of ways is, is beneficial for them. Uh, for so many reasons, including all of the musculoskeletal issues. And, and again, you know, weight, the nice thing about weight training is just measurable. It's yeah. really measurable. That's the nice thing about it. Yeah. Hearing you talk about strength training, I, I, it triggers some PTSD. I played college football and, and you say you applied the strength training principles to your practice. <laughs> I, that, I equate that with a lot of yelling and, and the <laughs> visual throwing up. So um, I, 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 I don't know if I want you to apply those principles to my uh, care treatment plan, but I. <laughs> it's actually funny. My, my team, we were, I, I was, I was joking. I said, you know, I'm not a yeller. And they said, how did you ever function as a strength coach? And I said, Oh, I, I did it then. Right. You know what I mean? But you right. know, now I, I got it out of my system. Uh, but now it's, it's encouraging. And, and I think part of it now is, is truly breaking down the barriers for people. Right. I mean, you know, there's a lot of these things that, I mean, I taught Olympic weightlifting to 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 athletes that had more talent on and, and things to do that I could never do. Um, 
but that's a very different aspect, right? And that's not what we're talking about here. You don't have to do some high level Olympic weightlifting to make real and tangible benefits, both for treatment and prevention of disease. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to just remind our audience, by the way, uh, that uh, feel free to submit questions uh, uh, in the chat and uh, we will uh, we will do our best as time allows to, to try to get to some of those. So uh, don't hesitate to, to ask some questions. Um, but but DJ, you've been uh, uh, not only a proponent of strength training um, and prevention, but you've been a big proponent of integrating digital technologies to improve both access and outcomes. Um, how do you think about uh, the integration of digital technology and how that can be used in a clinical setting, uh, specifically maybe to improve uh, this idea of pain management? Well, it breaks down barriers, right? I mean, it the we know that our digital communities really enhance uh, buy-in, utilization, et cetera. So home exercise bikes have been around for a long time. Uh, Peloton added a community, added gamification, added a number of things that took that allowed that to take off. Pedometers have been around for a very long time, but now that we actually get group communities and feedback where people are having these walking contests and encouragement from people, as well as information it allows. So it allows people to really engage in a different way. It's also challenging to go and, and go to a gym, to go to physical therapy, uh, to be there and drive. I mean, you know, going and seeing the doctor or seeing a therapist, it might be a half day venture by the time you actually go get in your car, go somewhere, change, do your exercises, come back. So a digital interface with a right program can reach into somebody's world and allow them to do them in their office, in their home. And you don't need, you know, crazy equipment or squat racks or, you know, Olympic bumper plates to, to get really benefits. You, you need some guidance, you need some feedback um, and digital healthcare allows that. And, and we've been building towards it for a while, right? We, we've had things like WeFit and motion captures and all kinds of different things that have been coming in. The technology has, has been building. So now we, we have the ability to give motion sensors and, and motion feedback, things that Hinge is doing to allow you to, I mean, I've done some of the exercises in my own office, right? In the office I'm sitting in and I'm busy and it's really nice to be able to do this. We're not talking adding three hours of therapy a day, right? Where yeah. you can add a few minutes. I think that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I haven't ever really thought of Peloton as, as a, um, as a, as a, you know, as an analogy, but now I think about it, um, uh, there are a lot of similarities, this idea of, you know, one convenience, uh, you know, creating access that fits into my life. Uh, and then the idea of being able to provide that kind of real time feedback. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, Dennis Morton is in the gym with me, you know, That's doing the class together. I'm getting the metrics, the data back. I'm also getting, uh, you know, the real time feedback and, and it creates an experience though, that also, uh, is both convenient, uh, and, you know, produce the outcome you're looking for from the convenience of my own home. So I mean, um, giving yeah, somebody an exercise sheet and saying, go exercise. Exactly. It's exactly. For a lot of people, right. They get home, they're hurting. They don't know if, if how they're doing it, you know, if they're doing it right there, there's no feedback, whether either their form is right or they need to modify. And that's where the digital world can interface uh, really nicely with that. Yeah. Um, DJ, we got a question from the audience, um, and it's, uh, I think it's a, a good question that is maybe on the minds of a number of folks is, is you know, what's your advice to people, to, to your patients who are maybe in such severe pain uh, that they can't engage in exercise or in physical therapy right away? It's just, it's just too hard. It's just too painful uh, to start. That's a, that's a great question. So first, you have to realize not all pain is the same, Right. And there is a spectrum and a continuation of what people are experiencing. And some pain syndromes are actually very severe pathology that needs a workup, diagnosis, treatment, and needs different routes. So the answer isn't for everybody with back pain or pain in general, just to go exercise. We do know if everyone exercised, we would probably have less back pain um, and it would treat a large number of them. But this is where you know, the appropriate evaluation and treatment by a trained specialist or a trained provider to make sure you're not missing something, you know, and, you know, there's a there's a role for a, a number of things that can help alleviate pain, you know, in the short term, there are analgesics and medications have problems. There are people that will put electrical stimulation, there's all kinds of things we can do 
to temporarily reduce the pain. But I, I think if you're so severe that you can't exercise, it probably warrants a, 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 an evaluation before you just take and say, let me start. That That's not what I view a, um, a majority of treatments for, meaning I think you need some, like I said, not all back pain is the same. Yeah. And, and people need different things um, that can be stratified by a trained specialist. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question that has come in uh, specific to, to your practice and Vandy is, is how does Vanderbilt address uh, social determinants of health and yeah. the impact that those have uh, on how we experience pain and, on, and how people perceive pain? I think social determinants of health impact, uh, I mean, they're determinants of health. They're a main driver of health and health affects everything. So it's not just our pain experiences, it's our ability to gain care, it's our ability to treat. So Vanderbilt's fully invested, meaning we have, uh, we've really put a lot of effort into um, social determinants to understanding the community we're treating, to treat it um, through uh, diversity and inclusion, engagement, all kinds of things that way. And I think that's one of the things we have to really look at, right? When we're when we're treating patients, you know, some people need, because they hurt so bad, they need to see a, a doctor. Uh, some people need hands-on individual therapy, right? Even for those people, I say something digital like what Hinge is offering is a nice augment to it. And some people need just the, the digital interface and doing something like this that doesn't have that, okay, now you've got to drive or get a ride or take a bus to a centralized therapy location. You've got co-pays, you've got time out of your schedule, you've got time off work that might not be given to you and you're taking a pay cut because you're trying to go and get therapy. That is where all of these kind of technologies can play. Meaning we really should leverage our technology basis to treat everyone. And the benefit yeah. is what used to be really for the haves, right? Hey, technology was so expensive and so hard. It, it was it was the neat thing at Stanford. Oh yeah, look at this neat little gadget we've got. It is now actually breaking down barriers to healthcare for everyone. And that's yes. what I'm, I'm just super thrilled about it. it. I am not going to declare it as there, right? I'm not gonna say we've done, we've solved this because we have not, right? Um, but we are moving in the directionality of good. And it's because some of these technologies allow us to have a bigger impact um, for a good chunk of people that would benefit from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just touched on something that made me think, you know, that concept of affordability and access. You know, it, it makes you think about a topic that I'm personally passionate about, and that's uh, the challenges of delivering care in rural settings. Uh, affordability, access, quality, you know, they're all challenges uh, experienced by many people in rural settings. Um, and, you know, and, and a lot of people, as I talk to, to folks, uh, uh, practitioners, uh, employers that, you know, they don't understand how access and quality uh, can be really limited, especially for physical therapy. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, digital health and, and, and how we can, you know, how we think that may play a role. Can you just expand a little bit about, you know, your ideas yeah, and kind of what sure. we're seeing to this, uh, maybe as part of the solution to this rural health problem? Uh, absolutely. So I, um, I grew up in a small town in the panhandle of Florida, uh, not over by the beaches, um, in the swamps, equally beautiful. Um, <laughs> but in, in the swamps, it got its first traffic. Like when I was in high school, the whole County did. And my parents still live in the log cabin house that I grew up in. And, uh, my father is a service connected veteran for a while was having to drive a couple hours to go get care. And he's got some, some of his care is now closer to him, but our, you know, people in rural America and Tennessee is rural, right? I mean, you know, Nashville is not, but Tennessee, I, I see a number of people that are having to drive hours to see me um, from a variety of States. So something when you can truly interface with them digitally and, you know, admittedly, we still have ways to go in terms of our ability to reach into people's houses um, with bandwidth and everything else uh, from a digital footprint, but it allows access. And I would actually say that the problem is bigger than just rural America. I mean, rural America, it's a real problem. I mean, people may have one therapist, they may not have expertise, uh, they may, you know, uh, an, an inability to do it, they may have access problems. And not only all the things we mentioned before of driving and going to this therapist that may be a town away or an hour away, um, then they've got to get in and make sure they can see him and everything else. It's just challenging. But 
you know, non-rural America has this problem too. I, I lived uh, in the Bay Area. I worked at Stanford. Um, you know, there are times going 10 miles can take two hours. Um, mm. And, you know, I mean, you're trying to get, get to this. So even in areas that are populated and you might have more therapists, it still takes an inordinate amount of time to go to therapy. And I'm not trying to say people don't need hands-on therapy. I think there's a real role for that. This is, this allows this to be complementary to that for the people that need it. Um, I mean, think about it. If we, the number of people in nursing homes, I mean, if you could give right. them some feedback and I mean, who wouldn't want that for a loved one, right? Something that is actually helping them move in a nursing home when you're not there that gives them feedback. So we have a lot of ways that we can improve access through simple digital solutions. And that's what I'm a proponent of is, is how do we expand this for the benefit of all our patients? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, as, as a leader in this space, I think you, you know, you probably appreciate the, the, the elegant integration of in-person care and digital care together. They're not uh, competitive. In fact, they're very complementary. And I think we as a digital health industry actually have an opportunity to, to do more in, in, in integrating, uh, you know, the analog and the digital world in ways that, you know, create a better experience for the member or for the patient and, uh, and drive even better outcomes at hopefully uh, a significantly lower cost. So yeah, just um, think about it. Instead of having to go to a physical therapist two times a week for six weeks, you go to a physical therapist that puts you in the right program, you follow and you maybe go three or four times over that six week period. And then the rest of the time you're getting daily exercises at home with feedback via digital solution. Yeah. So not only are you probably decreasing your overall cost, you're making it more accessible to the patient, but you're also getting more outcomes, more ability to track, more input for the patient and in a much easier way for them to, to digest. So I, I think this is, there's, yeah. there's a lot of promise here. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Um, so we're running, uh, you know, we'll come up to the end of our, our time together. Um, and, you know, I, I, I mentioned in the beginning that you said the intersection of both the present and the future and so as we kind of start to look towards the future, um, I'd love to, you know, maybe get one prediction from you about what you see uh, in 2023 and beyond, uh, whether it's the MSK space or really just in healthcare in general, uh, maybe yeah. one prediction for the audience. Um, aside from my beloved Seminoles returning to football prominence, which I hope <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, I'm always hopeful, but I can't predict it. But I, I really think the last couple of years, um, COVID has been an accelerant on many changes that were happening. So, you know, the ability to do virtual digital medicine has um, taken off. When, when we, we had the technology to do it three years ago, we, had it, we struggled from a whole bunch of logistics and, and reasons. And now I don't do a clinic without some level of a virtual component. And I think that's spectacular, right? I mean, so you combine that with all of the things we've got, motion capture and, and technologies, and we can do this, I think we will be able to deliver more individualized care at better access to a greater swath of patients at a better price point, right? Um, you know, and I think that's, that's pretty fascinating, right? And if we expand that and really get, especially the, when we, if we can get the, um, business, the employers to, to really think proactively, which many, many, many are right about not the ounce of prevention and pound of cure, get them doing and getting something for people to move. We may even have less because when you take a stat of 90% of people having back pain at some point, and you take that stat, we have room to improve. And, you know, I, I think that there's, we know some of the ways to do this and some of the ways probably the most effective cost efficient is getting people to exercise. If that were easy, it, everyone would be exercising all the time. So digital yeah. integration is just one more way of making that happen. Yeah. As Dale was saying it, it, the, the answer might be simple, but it's not always easy. Correct. And, uh, and, uh, and that's something for us all to keep in mind. Um, Dr. Kenny, thank you. It, it, it's been a, a real pleasure. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule down at Vandy. Uh, Vandy may not uh, be threatening to win a national football championship this year, but I understand that you guys are both a baseball and a bowling powerhouse. And so uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep our eyes out for Vanderbilt bowling here this year. Um, keep your eyes but out for Vanderbilt bowling. And, 
And Vanderbilt Physical Medicine Rehabilitation, we're, uh, we're taking over the world. We're trying to do great things. And I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to work with people I work with. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for your guidance. Uh, individuals like you challenge us at Hinge. You push us. Uh, you question us. Uh, and ultimately, you make us better. And the pursuit of better is what uh, we, are all, uh, we are all about. So, you know, we talked again today about this idea of access and affordability, the power of convenience and removing friction. Uh, we talked about this idea of prevention and, and how do we uh, make it easier. We talked a little bit about strength training. And again, I, uh, we don't have to talk about that anymore. Uh, again, I, I hearken back to, to dark days in the weight room uh, in college. But, uh, and, um, and ultimately, you know, we talked about how do we, uh, as both in-person practitioners and uh, healthcare technologists, how do we come together to create a, a better experience for our members, for our patients, that ultimately produces better outcomes and uh, and lower costs. So, so DJ, thank you again, um, professor and chair uh, at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, to our audience, thank you for taking time of your busy day to join us. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this episode of Pain Points, the ongoing series where I'm joined by industry and academia leaders, experts and practitioners to explore the intersection of healthcare, technology, and innovation. Follow Hinge Health on LinkedIn and Twitter for updates uh, on our next episode and our next guest. Until then, I'm your host, Jim Persley, and we'll see you next time on Pain Points.